Hello and welcome to the Mum Boss Method podcast. I'm Chrissy and I'm the Mum Boss and you're joining me today for another Mum Boss at Home community check-in. If you're not sure what that is, I run a amazing community of women and help them to achieve their weight loss, health and fitness goals online and every week they complete a check-in form for me and this podcast is how I get them their feedback, get them help, get them tips. They learn from each other, they learn from each other's challenges and successes and if you want to know more about that then check the link in the show notes or come and find me on Instagram the mum, at the mum boss method and I can tell you more about it. Now before I dip into this week's check-in Um, which is a couple of days late because I have been away in Barcelona. I wanted to just talk to you a little bit about that trip to Barcelona. Don't worry, I'm not about to sit here and give you a load of um, tourist attractions to go to see in Barcelona because maybe you're not planning on going there or you've been and you don't need to go again. But I just wanted to talk to you about the fact that I was away for four nights Um, It was meant to be three nights, but my husband booked the wrong flight home. So we had to change our flights to Tuesday morning, find another hotel and stay an extra night, which was a shame. We got another night. It was lovely. But I was away for four full days and four nights. And um, it was a city break with me, Tom, my husband and my son, Charlie. And it was the first time we've ever taken Charlie on a little city break like that. He's never done anything like that with us before. And we went away, stayed in an apartment. No one had to cook. No one had to clean up. We ate out in restaurants every single day. And what I just wanted to explain to you is that that was four days out of my week. And it was four days where I didn't track calories. I ate, like I say, I ate out every day. I would say I ate out fairly indulgently. If you saw any of my pictures of my breakfasts on Instagram, you will definitely agree that I ate out fairly indulgently. I drank alcohol every day and I didn't really give too much mind to what I was eating other than was there protein in there because quite frankly eating a meal without protein is is just cause for me being hungry again in an hour. Now I was super active over those four days. We we did 90,000 steps in four days which is a lot of steps and I didn't work out obviously Uh, I didn't get much sleep because it's quite noisy there where we were staying was quite noisy Um, and you might have done something like this and then come back and thought right I'll just stand on the scales and stood on the scales and been like oh my gosh I've put on five pounds I've undone all of my good work what's the point I've put on all that that weight back on in four days. Firstly, I haven't stepped on the scales. Um, Not intentionally, really. Um, I thought about doing it this morning, but actually I had a live workout with my at-home ladies who are listening to this. And for those of you, again, that aren't part of the at-home community, you get to do live workouts with me if you so choose. But I had a live workout to do this morning, followed by boot camp. I needed to walk the dog, get the child to football camp, all of the stuff. So I just didn't think about it. I got up, got changed, got ready for, for my workout and carried on. But having thought about it, I know that if I stood on the scales this morning or tomorrow morning, they are going to be a couple of pounds up. Knowing my own body, I would hazard a guess they would have been about four pounds up. Does that mean I have put on four pounds of body fat in four days? Absolutely not. It's impossible to put on four pounds of body fat in four days. In order to do that, I would have had to have eaten at my maintenance calories, which is, let's say for argument's sake, it's 2,000 calories, plus another 3,500 calories every day for four days. Now, 
I can put it away, but I cannot put away 5,500 calories every day for four days. And don't forget, I did 90,000 steps. I did at least 20,000 steps every day. So I was also being super active. So we know that steps, you know, are a great way of expending energy. So there is no way I ate 5,500 calories every day for four days. So I know that those four pounds would not be body fat. They're mostly water retention from traveling, from more alcohol, from uh, saltier, richer food, from less sleep. There's also going to be an amount of food volume in there because I'm eating more volume of food. I definitely had bigger meals. I had richer meals and my digestion would have taken longer to digest that food. So I still probably have some of the food from yesterday and maybe even Monday evening in my system. So most of this is water retention. Now, if you are the type of person that has a bit of an indulgent weekend or even a week away, comes back, stands on the scales and thinks, oh my gosh, I've ruined all my hard work. This is what you need to understand. In order to put on a pound of body fat, you need to eat 3,500 calories over and above your maintenance calories. And that's quite hard to do. And that's then not including any movement you've done that day. So you'd be really hard pushed to do that. So I need, I just wanted to share that with you because it was top of mind knowing that I was coming back to our check-ins. And yeah, so just, just consider that when you have a weekend away or even a holiday away, because I know a few of the ladies are on holiday. It's half term. I know a few of you are away at the moment. Okay, let's go through the wins and then we'll talk through the challenges and the questions then. Okay, Sarah stuck to her five planned workouts and even squeezed in an extra mini home workout. Well done. Jackie had no cravings and definitely had weight loss. Um, Janet's biggest win is getting up in the morning. Janet had a tough week last week. Um, and, and actually, that sounds a bit tongue in cheek, but um, Janet getting up in the morning and going out for a walk is a massive win because she loves just snoozing and being in bed. Um, Lisa had six out of seven nights sleep. She slept for a minimum of eight hours and finally feeling less tired. And then, and she knows that it's not all about the scale weight. It's finally going in the right direction. Great. Well done. Claire went to boot camp with a sore leg. She did indeed. And uh, we adapted necessary, the exercises where necessary. Julie was on holiday and she made great breakfast choices while she was away. She chose fruit and yogurt or eggs every morning. Um, Hannah wore a black dress while she was on holiday that's previously been too tight. Well done, Hannah. It was a great feeling. And she's also continuing to eat a lot of fish and salads, fruit and yogurt for breakfast. She's enjoying lots of water and she's been doing aquafit classes while she's away, which is amazing. Um, Lynn's got steps in, less snacking and less alcohol. Um, Emma was really poorly with norovirus most of the week, but she definitely met her, met her sleep goals. Tracy ate out twice and tried to make sensible choices, avoiding high calorie desserts. Well done, Tracy. Laura joined a, wor a live workout. Well done, Laura. Jamie did two teeny runs with much more stamina than she expected. Well done. Claire totally smashed her steps this week while she was on holiday exploring. Stacy got in good family dinners, accommodating more protein and less carbs and made fresh soup for lunches every day. Well done. Steph achieved her sleep goal. She was also really poorly. So get, just getting through a tough week was a great win. Antonella went for a couple of long walks. So great wins there from everyone that checked in. Really proud of you all. Okay, so let's go through some of the challenges and questions then. So 
I've really struggled with giving into foods this week. Again, waking up with the best of intentions, healthy breakfast and lunch prepped, and then the hunger hits mid-afternoon and I cave. I got back in the right mindset before the weekend and have made much better decisions. And connected to that, the excuses this person was making was constantly saying, I'll start again tomorrow because it's getting boring now. Okay, so for any of you that find yourself caving to whether it's mid-afternoon, mid-morning snacks or snacking in the evening, what I want you to think about are a couple of things. So firstly, are you eating enough protein? Are you eating big enough meals? So l lots of women, when they start working with me, they think that they need to eat s a small meals with as least calories as possible in them in order to make progress and actually that's going about this the whole wrong way okay I want you to be trying to get as much protein as much fruit veg fiber into your breakfast as possible and then the same again for your lunch so you should be trying to aim for at least 25 grams of protein in your breakfast and lunches okay my regular breakfast is 40 grams of protein and that keeps me going until 12, 12.30, okay? So I really, first thing I want you to do is think about, am I going for the smallest, lightest calorie options possible or am I really trying to keep myself full? So that's the first question. Then I want you to think about, are you truly hungry or is this emotional is it boredom is it procrastination is it tiredness so i want you to really think about what it what is actually going on for you at the time so if you think well i think i'm maybe hungry okay try drinking you know a good glass of water give it 10 minutes are you still hungry you know are you shaky are you feeling hunger pains? Think about when was the last time I ate? Was it longer than three hours ago? Okay, if it was longer than three hours ago, I probably do need to eat. If it wasn't longer than three hours ago, if it was only two hours ago, I shouldn't really need to eat. If I got enough protein in, I got enough fruit and veggies in, I got enough fiber in. If I got enough volume in, right? We want to think volume foods. Lots of lean protein, fruit, veggies, fiber. Am I getting big enough meals in my meals or am I keeping my meals really tiny and then just surviving on 400, 500 calories worth of snacks through the afternoon and into the evening, right? So have I, have I eaten in the last three hours? If it's yes, you shouldn't be hungry if your meals are big enough. If you haven't, then you probably do need to eat, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. Then... If you if you've eliminated the fact that you're you actually realize you're not hungry then I want you to really think about what what's going on for me right now is it the middle of my work day and I'm about to do something I really don't want to do that I'm procrastinating on am I feeling a bit stressed am I feeling a bit anxious am I bored am I angry am I upset what's going on for you right there and then because Often our response is to eat something when we're feeling some of these emotions, okay? So I want you to really consider what's going on. Um, so, and you know, if the hunger is hitting, this person said, is the, hung the hunger's hitting mid-afternoon, are you eating your lunch too early? Now, this person might be stuck with what time they, they eat lunch because they work in a school, so maybe they have to eat lunch at a certain time. But then we need to be looking at, okay, what time is breakfast? What time is lunch? Is that lunch big enough? Am I keeping myself going? If, if it's a regular thing that I'm getting to, say, I can't eat my lunch any later than 12.30 and I'm getting to 2.30, 3 o'clock and I'm hungry. Okay, what? how can I prepare a snack? If you know you're likely to get snacky at say 3, 4 p.m., how can I 
make sure I have a snack to hand that is really going to help me to keep going until dinner. So that could be like a protein yogurt, your protein pouch yogurt, a protein pudding, a protein bar, a couple of boiled eggs. Um, it could be some, you know, nicely chopped up fruit. Everyone knows that fruit tastes so much nicer when it's chopped up. And, you know, a small handful of nuts. Um, if you eat meat, it could be something like beef jerky, which I know my husband absolutely loves. Um, I'm not, I don't eat it, obviously. Um, you know, a couple of baby bell lights are, you know, two baby bell lights are something like 10 grams of protein and 100 calories. So if you are really confident that your breakfast and lunches are um, filling you up, they are enough protein, there are enough volume, there's enough fruit and veg, but you're still getting hungry at this time and you are convinced it is hunger, it's not some kind of emotion led or boredom led, then how can you prepare for that snacky time and what you need to be doing? So rather than just taking away the snack and banning yourself from it, how can you prepare to give your body something that you know is actually going to keep it going, not something that is going to um, just keep crashing you down, right? <clears throat> Sorry, I'm a bit out of breath today. Um, so yeah, that's what I I would say about that. Um, also, I would look at things like your steps and your activity. So this person got loads of workouts in last week. Um, you know, then look at also your steps. If you are pushing to the you know the top of your movement level if you're getting 10 15 20 000 steps if you're doing five six workouts if you're including running in that that might well push your hunger up okay so make sure you're eating at the top level of your calorie range make sure your protein is on point you would if you're being that active you probably want a bit more protein but also make sure you are not avoiding carbs if you are being that active. I want you to make sure you're including carbs, okay? If you've gone through that process of elimination and you still are not finding that there's an answer, then message me in the group and let's, let's work on this a bit more. Now, the excuse that this person made is that they're constantly saying, I'll start again tomorrow. It's getting boring now. I mean, you've answered your own question, right? I talk about you needing to be consistent at least 80% of the time. Okay, so work out what 80% consistent looks like for you. If you're a three snacks, sorry, three meals a day and two snacks person, how many of that how many of those need to be on point? I'm not saying on plan because there is no plan, but how many of those need to be nutritiously um, wise and well thought through versus how much can be your 20, 15, 10% of enjoyment? The other thing to think about is if you are saving 200, 300, 400 calories for sweet treats and snacks, at the end of the day, that is too much. That is too many calories to be spending on snacks and sweets and treats, okay? Absolutely, I don't want you to avoid the food that you love, but I do want you to be considerate of how many of your calories are being saved for these things. So most of you, you know, are on somewhere between 1,500, 1,800 calories, you know, if you're saving 400 calories for your snacks and treats, that could be nearly a third of your calories in the day. So your meals need to be bigger, okay? We actually don't really need to snack. If we, if we plan our meals well, we don't really need to snack. But, you know, include them if they're something that you really enjoy. But I would, I would really question what's going on behind that. <clears throat> okay, hopefully that helps. Okay, next question or challenge. This person's just put alcohol, exclamation mark. Um, 
and I thought I'd bring this in as well as I know that you know we've got a couple of people on holiday this week you know one comment here was whilst having healthy high protein meals I'm also indulging this week I know the challenges of drinks and ice cream on tap is short-lived though so this person's on holiday you know we should enjoy our holidays we save for our holidays like I've just told you about my trip to Barcelona you know I knew that that wasn't forever it was for four days that I was going to be eating and drinking like that and I've come back and returned to my habits so knowing that there's an end point but still remaining you know active and making some good choices around that but when it comes to alcohol for you know just for the sake of drinking alcohol and that constantly being your challenge there's some tough love incoming now okay if you are drinking regularly and I mean more than one or two times a week even if it's only one or two drinks each time you are not making the best decision for your health alcohol is quite literally poison and I say this as someone who drinks okay I'm not I'm not being you know a sober Sally and trying to tell everyone they shouldn't drink I've just told you I spent four nights in Barcelona and I drank every day but if you are choosing to binge drink regularly Thursday Friday Saturday Sunday you are damaging your health your long-term health that is not good for you it is poison and if you do that you will not achieve your goals, whether they are weight loss goals, whether they are just being healthier, stronger, fitter, you will not achieve your goals because it is not just about the calories with alcohol, okay? It is about how it affects your sleep because it does affect your sleep. So anyone who chooses to drink alcohol to relax, to help them wind down, to help them go to sleep, you are keeping yourself more stressed because alcohol is a stressor on your body. It damages your sleep patterns, more stress on your body. You are keeping yourself more stressed. If that is how you choose to unwind, you are keeping yourself stuck in that position. Okay, that's the truth of it. Drinking more than once or twice a week, binge drinking, you know, even drinking half a bottle of wine three, four, five times a, a week is damaging your health. It will also be meaning that you, so you're not sleeping, you will make poorer choices, you will not be performing as well in your job, in your life, it will not be helping your mental health, it will lower your motivation, it will lower your mood, it will lower your sex drive, all of these things. So this is really a choice, this is a choice. If you are choosing to drink regularly, then, then what you need to do is consider your goals and your health, okay? Now, I'm not, what I'm not suggesting is that anyone in, that is, you know, talking to me has got an issue with alcohol. That is not what I'm here to do. And that is not my forte, but... I know this per person in particular has raised this as a point regularly in check-ins. So regularly having more alcohol than, than they should be consuming. So there's a question there for you to think about is, you know, what is it that is driving you to be drinking this much? What are the habits, what are the behaviours, what are the situations, what are the people that mean that you are in putting yourself in this position. So really think about it, you know, we're not talking about a chocolate bar three or four times a week. If you're choosing to drink to excess regularly, you are damaging your health, okay? Um, okay, so... 
not drinking enough water even though I've got my water bottle next to me during the day but I'm not drinking it I'm not focusing on my needs whilst working how to listen to your body when you're distracted with work so this has come up a few times you know work getting in the way a couple of things I I suggest is to get yourself into the habit of regularly drinking water you know this person said they've got a water bottle in front of them on their desk every day okay can you set an alarm can you if you wear like an apple watch or something like that every time it dings to tell you that you need to stand up can you drink water stand up stretch your legs you need to set some boundaries for yourself you need to find some reminders some ways of reminding yourself because i bet you that you meet all your deadlines at work i bet you you get all your work done for everyone else so you're not doing those things for you so you know setting some reminders setting some boundaries creating some habits okay it's 10 o'clock every day at 10 o'clock i just i get up maybe i make myself a cup of licorice tea which you know that's great because that's got um liquid in it as well and whilst i'm making the tea i'm going to have a few big sips of water and just do a little walk around the office to stretch my legs and everyone who listens regularly knows i can't drink can't talk about water without drinking water because i've created a habit for myself um so making these things a habit how can you stack the habits so you know i'm sure everyone thinks about if you think about what you do when you first get up in the morning and i think i've talked about this on the podcast before so i get up the first thing i do when my alarm goes off is i take three or four big chugs of water because i've not drunk anything all night i go into the bathroom I do a little tinkle, some ETMI, and then I put my gym stuff on. When I've put my gym stuff on, I brush my teeth. And because my gym stuff is laid out on the bathroom floor in order, you know, my heart rate strap goes on, then my sports bra, blah, blah, blah. And then the same again in the evening. So how do I remember to take my HRT? My HRT sits out on my um in my bathroom and i put it on before i brush my teeth because it's gel it needs to dry so then while i'm brushing my teeth i walk around the bedroom getting a few extra steps and letting my gel dry before i put my pajamas on so how can you habit stack some of these things you need to do okay um okay the kids being off school and bickering meant I made some decisions for an easier life rather than choosing foods that align with my long-term goals. So what I want to just talk about here is it's at the moment for me it's the school holidays. I think it was the school holidays for a lot of people last week. I don't know whether we're a bit late here but kids have like 13 weeks off a year and maybe not all of you you know some of you might work term time only some of you might always try and take some of that time off whilst the kids are off as well you might work part time so therefore you might you know um have a few days every holiday with the kids um kids will bicker and we do need to che choose our battles but here's a little bit of truth if the kids constantly get the choices made for an easier life for you, that will be the choice that you always make, right? How can I explain this? So today, um, I was teaching boot camp and boot camp doesn't finish until 10 15 at 5 to 10 my son is messaging me telling me that because it's really raining at football camp they're going inside and he didn't take his trainers with me with him because he decided to go to football in sliders in pouring rain obviously um now one of the things i always used to do was if he forgot something at school i would drive it up to him bearing in mind that his primary school was a good 20, 25 minute drive away from us, depending on where at uh, the, the time of day. And in year seven of secondary school, I, I started to do the same thing. Now, was I going to leave him today to 
miss out on football because everyone else well actually it wasn't everyone else loads of kids didn't take trainers no I wasn't and luckily his friend's mum said to me don't worry I'll pick them up from you and I'll take them up there because she had to take her sons anyway but here's the thing the easy option for me could be to constantly do the things that mean he's let off the hook every time every time he forgets PE kit at school I could take it in every time he forgets a book or home economics food ingredients or this or that I could take it to him because that's easier than me thinking oh everyone's going to think I'm a rubbish mum what's really easier in the long term because if I'd had to go and do that today I probably would have been working well into the evening to get everything done so um, I hope that that kind of story helps you because I realise that sometimes we have to pick our battles with our kids but if you pick your battle if you give in to everything that need, that will give you an e easier life every time the kids bicker then you are going to be giving in a lot and if, if every time you give in means you're choosing something that moves you away from goals rather than towards your goals, then that's a lot of choices that you're, that you're making that are moving you away from your goals. So I guess what I'm saying is I absolutely understand choosing your battles. But I also really want you to hear that sometimes choosing yourself and explaining to the children why you're choosing yourself is really important as well mm. you know let's say they were arguing because they wanted mcdonald's or you were just knackered so you got the mcdonald's because you were sick of listening to them um arguing how could you have turned making them a homemade dinner into something that relaxed you and calmed you down or got them involved so they didn't have the opportunity to bicker now obviously i don't know the full situation here so i'm just i'm just giving you some advice okay um so this links into a bit of what i was saying at the beginning i found that having a bigger breakfast seems to fill me up for the whole day then i really enjoy my dinner i found this has made it easier to eat in a calorie deficit do you think this approach is sustainable so far it seems to be working it's not something that i plan to do work has been so busy i've just not had time for a lunch break so here's my thing is I would imagine so you're having you're maybe making the effort for a bigger lunch a bigger breakfast because you know how busy work is um or are you because you've then said you've just not had time for a lunch break my concern would be and the same goes for if you take a fasting approach with breakfast, for example, is if you are doing this, you might be chasing things like your protein levels. So if you're missing a whole meal, it might be hard to get your protein in. Um, so fasting, this isn't really fasting, this is missing a whole meal. So fasting does work for some people, but it does make it harder to hit your protein levels this is this is missing a meal my concern would be that you end up binging at like four o'clock whilst you're cooking the dinner and you've got yourself really hungry so uh, personally my thought would and i know we've had this same situation with you before is how can you make lunch really accessible for you whilst you're busy now look i'm going to say something and i know a lot of you are going to roll your eyes at this but you know everyone deserves a lunch break even if it's just five minutes now i know what this person does but you know there has to be boundaries um and because protein is so important for this person in particular they are pre-diabetic so you know not um then relying on carby snacks is really important i would be really concerned that you weren't getting all that protein in 
So finding, is there a way that you could eat two smaller meals, say one at 11, so have your breakfast, have something at 11 and then say something at two? Because, I, yeah, my concern would be that your energy levels are going to dip and you're going to struggle to meet that protein goal. Um, and I would imagine as well, the reason you're not feeling the hunger across the lunchtime is just because you're so busy. Um, time management all wrong this week. I'm at my parents' early week, had family staying later in the week, food was inconsistent, plus sore legs stopped me doing as much exercise. Overall, too stressed at work and didn't adapt to changes. And I blamed that I didn't have time to plan. But I've got no questions. I know what I need to do, plan. So sitting here at Sunday lunchtime planning, good, well done. This is the thing. We think we're too busy to plan, but actually, when we plan, it becomes so much easier to adapt to the plan than if you haven't planned and the shit hits the fan and then you've got to go, well, what do I do now? I always think of it, do you remember those little slidey tile tool, uh, toys? You had like this frame and it had little tiles in it and maybe there was like four across and four down but there was the bottom one was missing and it was a picture and you have to like slide the tiles around to try and make up the picture and it could be quite frustrating because there was always like one you couldn't get in I guess it was a bit like it's a bit like a flat Rubik's cube right this is I see that I see planning like that is that it's like trying to create the picture without knowing what the picture is. It's like trying to do a jigsaw puzzle if you don't know what the slidey toy is. It's like trying to do a jigsaw puzzle without knowing what the what the picture is. The planning is knowing what the picture is. The planning might be doing the corners and the edges first if that's the way you roll. I mean who doesn't do that when they're doing a jigsaw puzzle? Don't know. Um, at least if you know what the picture is and what the edges are if someone tips the box up, you at least know where you're going from because you've got the picture and you know where, where to start. If you're just going in blind with a jigsaw puzzle or a slidey puzzle, then how do you know what you're doing? You're just sliding the things around, right? So as much as we think, oh, the planning, like maybe the jigsaw puzzle analogy was a better one. <laughs> You know, I love thousand piece jigsaw puzzles, love them. But if I just ticked one out and tried to start doing that puzzle without finding the corners and then making the edges and without sitting there and turning all the pieces upside down and maybe grouping them into similar colors where possible, that would take me ages. The, the puzzle would take me ages. Now I might sit there and think, yeah, but finding all the edges is gonna take me ages and sorting them into, you know, Colours is going to take me ages, yeah, but, and it's boring, I just want to get on with it, yeah, but it makes it easier in the long run, so that's what I want you to think about when it comes to planning. Um, okay, so this is from someone who's on holiday, I'm making the big excuse that I'm on holiday and I can have a pina colada or an ice cream if I want, but that's okay, it's an excuse I'm okay with and I accept there will be a gain. I'm proud that alongside this I'm also keeping the what can I do in my mind. I love this because this is, you know, I love that we have got ladies in this group that are going on holiday and that have still checked in and have still been in contact you know not that I expect everyone to be in contact every day but you've checked in you've been in contact you're still making decisions because yes we work hard for our holidays and yes we should enjoy them but also you know just generally moving every day is really healthy for you and if you go on a 10-day holiday and you don't move at all that's not great eating vegetables every day is healthy for you and believe me you know you won't feel great after 10 days if you haven't eaten a one eating protein every day with every meal is going to be good for you if you're in a hot country drinking water is even more important for you so the habits you're building 
mean that when you take your well-earned holidays every year, however many times you go, because some of those things are already ingrained as, ha as habits and as you continue this work, they'll build as stronger and stronger habits. It means when you come back, you'll have the mindset of, like I just explained at the front of the podcast, yep, I know the scales will be up. I know it's not all going to be body fat because that's impossible, but some of it will be water retention and volume of food and alcohol. And actually, I'm keeping some of my habits while I'm here on holiday and it's okay and I'm good with it. Whereas going to that all or nothing mindset of, oh, well, I'm on holiday, I may as well carry on. Ah, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do anything. You know, I don't expect anyone to be tracking their calories on holiday. Just keep in mind, you know, your choices that you're making and try to make some choices that align with your goals while still having an amazing time. Um, okay, had a few people that were unwell this week. When I'm unwell, I definitely crave comfort foods like chocolate. Do you have any recipes that may meet this without being too unhealthy? Okay, so firstly, one thing I've put in the WhatsApp group today, and I just want to reiterate it because there was a couple of questions like this, but question, like things like recipes and stuff, this is the benefit of having a community. Absolutely ask these questions in the WhatsApp group because I'm going to be really honest, ladies. I eat what I eat, what I eat, what I eat. I pretty much have the same breakfast every day. I have mostly the same one or two lunches and I rotate about 10 different dinners across every couple of months, right? And I mean, I've got, I'm looking now and I've got easily 20 recipe books on my shelf. Do I remember the recipes? No. You know, we see all these, oh, healthy healthy alternative to chocolate recipe on you know healthy healthy chocolatey snack with only three ingredients on instagram or whatever and it's like some i don't know chocolate bark thing firstly it's really really expensive ingredients secondly it's time consuming and takes ages to make and also the term healthy is really subjective OK, because it might be healthy because it's organic chocolate and there's dried fruit and nuts in there, which are, you know, whole foods and um, have good nutrients in it. But for a tiny little square, it might be 250 calories for a tiny little square. And actually a double twirl is 250 calories you may as well have just eaten the twirl because if you're unwell are you really going to want to make three ingredient chocolate bark i reckon you're probably not so the first point is i i absolutely am not the encyclopedia of recipes i'm really boring I, st I make my life easy for myself and I stick to it. So ask questions about recipes and meal ideas in the group. Secondly, if you are unwell and there is something that you fancy, it's okay to have it. But what I want you to also bear in mind is what do I want versus what do I need? Because if you're unwell, it doesn't matter whether it's been a sickness bug, it doesn't matter whether it's been COVID, whether it's a cold, a virus, whatever. What do you think your body needs? Do you think your body needs chocolate and sweet stuff or it needs nutrients? It will be craving chocolate and sweet stuff because what do we know about chocolate and sweet stuff? It's carbohydrates, your body sees it as very quick energy and your body will want that. And you know what? It's okay to honour that sometimes. But what you'll probably find is your body actually needs nutrients. No matter what illness you've had, your body needs some lean protein. It needs to help it heal. It needs some fruits and veg, some fibre because of all of the micronutrients in it. It needs some healthy fats. Okay, so what do I want versus what do I need? It's okay to honour those cravings sometimes, but I think you're probably better off having a chocolate bar rather than thinking about spending time and effort and probably a lot of money on three ingredient chocolate bark. I don't know why chocolate bark came to mind. I think it was something I saw over the weekend. Um, okay, so 
this is something that comes up often for this person I ate loads of crap being tired and feeling run down for weeks on and off now and it just makes everyone tired and grumpy wanting to eat rubbish and just not feeling like I can work out with the headaches it brings I think I need to take some echinacea or something so first my first point here is you don't there's not this is not about a supplement this is not about a supplement okay ladies eating fresh fruit veg getting fiber getting protein getting your watering getting some steps in doing the things that we're working on is what is going to give you the best chance of having energy of being less tired of not feeling rubbish okay if you're constantly getting headaches then you might want to see a gp but this isn't about a supplement that i mean i'm it sounds like i'm diagnosing you you know if you are if you're concerned that you are deficient in something see your gp but because i know this comes up for this person a lot they have a small child that often has trouble sleeping but they often have very low energy they don't have a routine they're often napping at different times of the day this isn't about needing echinacea this is about instilling these healthy habits trying to get yourself into a routine getting fruit veg protein healthy fats getting some movement into your body okay because the cycle is continuing you want to eat rubbish and you've put it here what what excuses have you been making tired eating sweets mindlessly telling myself it's okay because i'm doing it to get by um and then their commitment is cut out the crap food and the nonsense thought that it will give me energy it lasts all of 10 seconds and leaves me more tired it does not serve me so absolutely the point i'm trying to make is this is this is a a problem you're facing and you've been facing since you started and that we've talked about lots of times is not getting good quality enough sleep some of that you can't help because of the little one but that lots of it you can help by getting the movement in being consistent and getting um your good nutrition in so this is not about supplement this is about finding a routine and a structure and where possible trying to help yourself as much as possible around any of the, those poor that poor sleep that the little one is involved in now this is about finding out what works for you so what works for me is not going to be about what works for you but for sure me and this person have talked about this before is we need to find you, you or you need to find you a bit of a morning routine and a structure set some boundaries with those kiddie winkles about what is their jobs in the morning what is their jobs in the evening what are your jobs what do you need to get doing finding some routine and structure during the day with work so that you're getting some movement in you are making time for lunch or you're prepping something ahead of time setting some boundaries and then finding an evening routine that works as well what does bedtime need to be what does bedtime need to be so that you you have the best possible chance of getting the best possible amount of sleep okay knowing that you can't control what time the little one wakes up and if that's the bedtime then work backwards right what does wind down time need to be and what does wind down time look like what is your little routine and structure around wind down time if you're looking at a screen if you're watching netflix i recommend you stop that an hour before going to bed so this is about finding routine and structure and helping you to in, insert those healthy habits which are the antidote to how you're feeling but like i say if you are concerned that you're deficient in something please speak to your gp um okay this one i really resonate with sometimes i use my anxiety as a reason not to do something when i know it'd be good to actually do it uh, i hear you that's something that i um feel myself so at the weekend in barcelona we went to um 
the Barcelona football stadium we did a tour and with that tour we got this little game where you could take three penalties against this robotic goalkeeper right and there were loads of people watching and I'm standing in the queue and I'm saying to Tom I don't want to do it I don't want to do it I don't want to do it and he was like why and I said because all these people are watching and what if I miss and I'm really anxious and I don't want to do it and it's making me anxious and I feel hot and he was like, but it's just kicking a ball. You can kick a football. And Charlie just kind of looked at me and I thought, I can't not do this, can I? So I did it. Now, this might be completely on a different level to what you're talking about, but I kicked the football and I scored the penalty, didn't I? I missed the other two. But actually, that feeling of scoring that penalty and then the whole crowd clapped me, right? And I just thought... I've just shown my son that girls can kick footballs and he's really proud of me for doing that and my husband didn't score any goals um but also I've just pushed myself out of my comfort zone and it's just kicking a football so I absolutely feel you but what I would encourage you to ask yourself is When we feel, so anxiety is about a projection of what's going to happen in the future. So what are you worried about happening? Anxiety is about a loss of control, worrying that we don't have control over things. So what are you worried about happening? And what is doing the thing actually going to give you versus not doing it? What's what's that going to take away? Um, Right. Right, a couple of you have felt a bit like this. So last couple now. Once I got over the worst of my week, I could have started small habits back up again, tracking my water, tracking my calories at least, but struggling to start back within my routine, using the excuse that I'm still not 100%. So I know a couple of you felt this way. And it, it can be really hard. Remember, action trumps motivation start small what's one thing I can do today now I know that this person and the other person that was struggling with this in the group have actually now taken action today both of them but for anyone else listening if you're struggling to get back into it what's one small thing that you can do and then build on that um and then final question um after illness where exercise is concerned how quickly should you jump straight back in i was tracking my three weights exercise a week previously and wondering if it's wise to jump back to that this week when i'm not 100 percent better and i'm still lacking energy or do i try and just do what i can manage this is really individual and really um dependent on what you've been ill with so i know this person worked out with me this morning so she got back to trying bearing in mind these check-ins were done on sunday so i am a couple of days late but when you're ill firstly if you're still feeling rough don't train okay maybe go for a walk then when you feel like you can try try maybe drop your weights do a little bit less intensity okay but and then it's just a case of seeing how you feel so so you do one see how you recover can you give it a a day between that session and the next one see how you feel maybe you need to drop it you will find it comes back quickly um but it will only come back quickly if you listen to your body so if this person wakes up tomorrow and feels absolutely dreadful again they need to give it a day's break before they do anything else so listen to your bodies okay that's my dog making a noise okay well done everyone love listening to or reading out all of your wins and how you're doing um and if you have listened to this and you thought oh i'd like a bit of that i'd like chrissy to address my challenges and my questions and help me unpick some of my problems check out the show notes or come find me at the mum boss method on instagram and we can talk about how i can help you have an awesome week everyone